interesting. Thomas graduated from UniSA in 1992 as an electronic engineer where he was seduced by computers early in the first year, mostly due to the fact that holding a mouse the wrong way is a lot less painful than holding a soldering iron the wrong way. He was intrigued by the free as in beer and subver subverted by free as in speech soon after. When he's not indoctrinating geeklings, he works as a software engineer or at least he seems to be playing one in a long-running reality TV show. Projects he has worked on include everything from submarines to solar panels, cars to cows, and trains to telemetry. An interest in puzzles, as well as a slight case of paranoia, has led Thomas down the dark path of cryptography. He hopes that one day Schneier's law will be repealed so that he can finally finish his perfect cipher. Thomas is a recovering sysadmin and my father. <laughs> Um, that's very, very proud father. Thank you very much. Welcome all to my talk, uh, which I will not even try to pronounce. Um, just call it something 101. A beginner's guide to advanced paranoia. Just to start, I am not a cryptographer. I am not a lawyer. What I tell you may be wrong, but it will probably not be maliciously wrong. So double check what I tell you. Work it out for yourself. Just make sure you don't believe everything you hear. So cryptography is actually really, really simple. There are only four basic building blocks that make up most of the systems that you have around you. You need a random number generator. You need a hash function. You need a symmetric cipher. And you need an asymmetric cipher. So it's really easy, just like DNA. There's only four components and you know, a couple of ways to put them together. So trivial, really. It's, it's, it's amazing how often these things go wrong, even though they're so simple. Um, unfortunately, even having the basic building blocks is necessary but insufficient to make a secure system. So um, I'm going to play a little game of Crypto Lego and just put some of those blocks together to describe a few things that you might be able to do. So start with a random, random number generator. So when you have a 128-bit key, you're basically playing a game of I'm thinking a number between one and very, very big. And if you can guess that number, you get to see my encrypted data. So assuming that you have a good random number generator, it's going to be very, very difficult to guess that number. Or you have to try every possible number until you hit the right one. If you have a bad random number generator, things get a lot easier for the attacker. So for example, if you have a four-digit pin, there are 10,000 different combinations. If you have a four-digit pin, but you are a uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy tragic, and two of those digits are four and two, there are only 300 combinations. Similarly, with random number generators, if they're biased, if they're predictable, if they can be influenced by an attacker, you can vastly reduce what's called the key space or the entropy, and you can uh, make the work of the attacker much, much easier because it'll be a lot easier to guess that number. So there are problems. Uh, recently in Debian, somebody found some um, dead code, they thought, and they took it out, and it ended up being some rather important code, which increased the entropy of a random number generator, and they kind of accidentally led to the creation of lots and lots of weak keys, which had to be fixed. Uh, there are malicious things that can be done to random number generators, like, oh, I don't know, influencing a standards body to deliberately adopt one that's horribly, horribly broken. Uh, but who would do such a thing? And then, of course, there are um, the quote down the bottom sums it up rather nicely. Anyone who attempts to generate random numbers by deterministic means is, of course, living in a state of sin. The reason we love computers is because they are mo massively deterministic. We know exactly what we're going to get when we put stuff in, mostly. So trying to generate a random number on a computer is actually really difficult. You're missing something called entropy. And especially when you talk about, talk about low-powered devices, battery-powered devices, things that only have a few moving parts, like every Internet of Things device ever, you run into problems with low entropy. You, you can't generate good randomness. Um, if you want to solve this problem, go to a talk on later this week about the chaos key, which generates all the randomness you could possibly want. So that's the first of our blocks. Second block is a hash function. Common hash functions are MD5, which is kind of dying because it's a bit too old. Uh, the SHA series of hashes, there, there are others. 
what a hash function does is it takes an arbitrary sized chunk of data and turns it into a fixed size digest. And the idea is the output is deterministic but chaotic. That means the same input will always lead to the same output, but it's impossible to predict what that output is going to be. So the idea is if you have two blocks of data and they create the same digest, it's a really good chance that it's actually the same block of data. <coughs> Excuse me. So with our hash block, if we combine that with our random block, we can do something called password hashing. So rather than storing the plain text password, you get a random number and the password, you hash the two together and you store that hash. And that makes your password storage much, much safer. So, you know, crypto Lego, we've already combined two blocks to make something else. Um, hash functions are one of, the, one of the building blocks of blockchains and also uh, proof of work um, algorithms. So if you got both of those, then you just, you know, got Bitcoin. I believe Bitcoin's a little bit more complicated. There may be one or two other things you need, but basically that's all you need, um, a good hash function. Next you have the third of our blocks, the symmetric cipher. Lots and lots of uh, examples again, ROT13, maybe not the best one to use. DES, very, um, very old, very distinguished history, but um, getting slightly old. The AES set of ciphers and um, Blowfish, Blow2, Blow3, lots of symmetric ciphers out there. They work with what's called a shared secret key. Um, if you think of the padlock analogy or a locked box analogy, you have the same key as I do. We can both open and close the box at will. Um, if I want to send you something, a plain text, I encrypt it with a key and turn it into a cipher text. When I give that to you, you decrypt it with the same key and you get back to the plain text. Very simple operation. Um, very simple operation, but managing those secret keys and distributing them and having enough of them is actually really, really complicated. So these things are, in practice, seldom used all by themselves. They're also block ciphers. So they work on one block at a time. And one block is typically 512 bits or something along those lines. Now, if the data you happen to have is a bit bigger than 512 bits, you're going to need to do something to be able to encrypt more than that with a block cipher. So now, a bit more crypto Lego, we take a random block to create something called an initialization vector. And we add a symmetric cipher, AES, DES, whatever. And then we use one of these combining modes, uh, cipher blockchaining, output feedback, Google these afterwards, they're fun. And what that allows you to do is basically create a pipeline where you can shove as much data in one end as you want, and out the other side will come ciphertext. The initialization vector is critically important. It has to be there. It has to be random. It doesn't have to be secret, but it has to be random. And um, there is a certain software vendor that actually managed to make the same mistake twice where they did not randomize the initialization vector and kind of destroyed their... Um, uh, destroyed the security of their um, uh, save word document with uh, password. <coughs> Did I just give away the vendor? Um, so yeah, it's really simple to make a mistake in cryptography. And the best part is if I make a bug in software, the software crashes and I know I can fix, and I can fix it. If I make a bug in crypto, somebody else gets to find it and use it without me ever knowing about it. So that's why it's really hard to get crypto right, because you're not the one who finds the problem. Somebody else is. And you know, they're not even going to send you a thank you note. That's just rude. So our last block, the asymmetric cipher. RSA, ECC, more and more and more. Those are the two big ones. What you get there is instead of a single key, you get key pairs, commonly known as the private key and the public key. The private key, as the name suggests, should be kept secret, and only you know that. The public key can be given to anybody and distributed freely. There's no reason to keep it secret. These two keys have really cool properties. If you encrypt something with one key, you can only decrypt it with the other key. And if you can decrypt something with one of those keys, it must have been encrypted by 
the other key. I'll give you a couple examples of what that means. If I have plain text and I encrypt it with a public key and turn that into cipher text, the only person who can decrypt that cipher text is the person who has the private key. So if I give you my public key, you encrypt some data with it and send it to me, I can decrypt it, but nobody else can, even if they have the public key. No help to them. Similarly, if I have something with my private key, if I encrypt something with my private key, or rather, if, if I give you something and you manage to decrypt it with my public key, then you know it must have been encrypted with my private key. So, if you remember about the hash, if I have a block of data, arbitrary size, I create a little digest from it, and I encrypt that digest, and then I give it to you, if you manage to decrypt it with my public key, you know that I created that digest. And because that digest means, because that digest is related to the big block of data, you know that that big block of data probably came from me or is something that I signed. So this is how signatures work. You get the thing you want to sign, you turn it into a digest, you encrypt it with your public key, and then anybody who has your private, sorry, encrypt it with your private key, anybody who has your private public key can then decrypt it and verify that that is your block of data. Hilariously, um, I went to update my mobile phone contract, and they said, oh, we support digital signatures. And I thought, oh, cool, I've got to find out what this is like. Their idea of a digital signature is to use the mouse to write your name on the screen. <laughs> Not quite the same. <laughs> OK, um, one problem with asymmetric cryptography is that it is actually quite slow. Um, you're using some really fancy math with remainders and elliptic curves and all kinds of stuff. It's really quite slow. It's also a block cipher, so you only have one block of output at a time. If you want to encrypt some more, you need something called hybrid encryption. More crypto Lego. So I use a random block. I use a stream cipher, which is made up of a random block and a symmetric cipher. And I use my asymmetric cipher, and I stick those together, and I get what's called hybrid encryption. First thing I do is I generate a random number. If you remember on the slide, you know, I'm thinking a number between 1 and 30 bazillion. I create what's called a session key. That's created, used exactly once, shouldn't ever be written down. It's just used for this session. I get the plain text, whatever size I want. I use my stream cipher and that session key, and I go and create some cipher text from it. Then I take the session key, and I encrypt it with my asymmetric cipher to become my encrypted key. Now, the bits that I send you are the cipher text and the encrypted key. So when you receive that, you use the asymmetric cipher and the encrypted key to the recover the session key. And then you use the session key and the cipher text to recover the plain text. So now we've managed to avoid having to use really slow asymmetric cryptography all the time. We've managed to avoid having to pre-share a secret key. So for example, if I want to send you a great great lot of data, I don't have to meet you in a dark alley and exchange briefcases with secret keys. I just have to go and download your public key, and I can, I can follow this procedure, and I can send you data. This is really handy. It does mean that I need to know whose public key I'm actually using. This is where we have even more crypto Lego. We've already said, if I have a hash and an asymmetric cipher, I can create a signature. Now, if, I, if that hash happens to be of somebody's, Bob's public key, and it's signed by Alice's public key, Alice's private key, you now have what's called a certificate. What you effectively have is Alice vouching for Bob's public key. So if you trust Alice, and you have Bob's public key signed by Alice's private key, you can now trust Bob. Or at least you can trust that you have Bob's key. You can add more levels to this. You can have Carol's public key now being signed by Bob's private key, and, and so on and so on and so on. What you end up with is 
certification authorities. And if you, um, if you ever want to be terrified, go into your browser, go into the security settings, and get a list of all the certification authorities that your browser trusts. Each one of those is a catastrophic point of failure in your internet security. Any one of those can pretty much sign any certificate and make any HTTPS session in your browser look legitimate. So if you happen to trust the Albanian post office with your life and your life savings, that's fine. If not, you might want to go and edit out, the, uh, go, go to that list and uh, you know, weed out some of, the, some of the ones you're not so sure about. Or um, you can do uh, what, what I did, is you call up your bank and you ask them to verify their, um, their web certificate fingerprint. And I was amazed that the second person I talked to at my bank actually knew what I was talking about. I thought they'd just hang up on me as a crank call, but good on you guys. Anyway, um, yeah, so we have now created certification authorities, which are horribly broken, but that is in fact how all the entire web works. All the S protocols, HTTPS, FTPS, anything that comes with a certificate. Key sizes, you hear these discussed an awful lot. Uh, this is hopefully readable. It's, it's sort of cut and paste out of somebody else's document. Uh, the uh, CNSA Suite and Quantum Computing FAQ PDF, there's a link down the bottom. So basically the key size is um, how much randomness you're going to put into your key. Um, how many tumblers are in your house key? You know, is it one or two or three or 512 in this case? Every time you add another bit, you make the attackers work about twice as hard because they have twice as many possibilities that they have to try. Depending on the algorithm, you can actually make them work even harder. So having a large enough key is important. Having too small a key doesn't do, well, sorry, having a large enough key is important but doesn't guarantee security. The only thing it does is when your key is too small, it guarantees insecurity. So this is a common thing in cryptography. There's never a guarantee that you're doing it right, but there are lots of guarantees you're doing it wrong. And having too small a key is one of those. So these are the current suggested uh, key sizes. Um, RSA, this is one of these asymmetric ciphers. One of the things about asymmetric ciphers is they tend to need a much larger key than a symmetric cipher because there's a lot of redundancy and, and magical math and stuff like that. So what they're saying is basically a three kilobit RSA key. Whereas for AES, right down the bottom, 256 bits is fine. And uh, integrity, that's our hashing function, SHA-384. Anyway, um, those numbers will slowly climb as time goes on. You're free to use bigger numbers. You're free to use smaller numbers if you want to guarantee your system is not, in, is not secure. Uh, anyone here use GPG? Has everybody signed up to the key signing? No. Yes, Daniel's running the key signing. I, 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 sorry, Daniel, I've got another thing. I can't make it. <laughs> But you should, um, you, should, you should use GPG, it's fun. Um, you can create keys, distribute keys, trust keys, go to key signings, use it to um, send files around. Um, but I'm not gonna do a worked example. There are lots and lots of web pages that do a much, much better example of a better lead through of, of how to do this. Just search for them. Um, also, uh, GPG is non-trivial to set up because you have to integrate it with your mail client and you have to get it all working and then you change your mail client and it's all broken again. Personally, um, my recommendation would be if you want to just communicate with somebody, use something with encryption built in like Signal. If you want to do backups, you know, data at rest kind of stuff, GPG, fantastic, nice and easy to use. Integrating it with your mail client in order to send emails is something beyond me, not beyond many of you, I'm sure, but it's not something I've ever bothered doing too much. Um, it also means that your cryptographic GPG security critical thing now inherits all the bugs of your mail client, which I'm not entirely happy about. Obligatory XKCD cartoon. Now that you have encryption, of course, this is what will happen. Polite laughter, somebody got it, everybody else has already seen it. <laughs> Wrong conference for this one to be new. 
Okay, problem with crypto is it doesn't make problems go away, it just swaps them for other problems. So if I have a secret and I want to tell you the secret, great, I can use symmetric cryptography and I don't have to worry about a secret channel, but then I have to worry about getting secret keys to everybody I want to talk to and different keys to different people and all that stuff. Oh no, I can use asymmetric cryptography, that solves all my problems. Except now I have to distribute my certificates. Wait, I can use certification authorities, that'll solve all my problems. Except certification authority, the whole model is horribly broken because you have multiple catastrophic points of failure. All, this, all the root CAs. So I use a web of trust like GPG users. But that's a little bit hard. You actually have to work, and who wants to do work just to stay secure? So you just kind of hope for the best. So yes, uh, do not go out and write a crypto system based on this talk, <laughs> please. Um, there are some excellent books that are out there, um, and there are some really horrible ones too. Um, but uh, if you want to do crypto as a hobby, it's, it's really fun. Otherwise, I guess you wouldn't be here. Um, if I think there's about five or so minutes left, we can either start discussions or flame wars or questions. I'm happy with either. If there are any hands. Yes. Okay, the question is, have I heard about the mail pile project? The answer is no. Um, and, and the other question was, what do I think of it? And I think it has to do with mail, but beyond that, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, um, it's a project that's, that uh, provides a web client, a web interface as a web client to make uh, GPG and email um, much more user friendly. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so. Um, my general, I don't know this project, I don't know what they're doing, but generally when it's a web client, you're downloading code from somebody else. So unless you really, really trust them and everybody in the middle and the horribly broken certificate authority that makes you trust them and your JavaScript interpreter and all the other tabs that may be breaking into your thing and your browser and your everything else, fine, yeah, no, it's no problem at all. <laughs> No other questions? Nobody wants to start a flame war? <laughs> oh, must have been a really good talk. There are no questions left. Okay. <laughs>